Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our February edition of Book Buzz. And this month we are celebrating Black History Month. We'll be presenting books by Black authors in adult fiction, adult nonfiction, and adult graphic novels. My name is Betty McDowell. I'm one of the adult services librarians here at the library, and I'm joined by Shermaine Burleson, our catalog and technical services librarian, and Meg Miller, who's also an adult services librarian. Just a reminder, you can check out new books on our catalog. Just go to the What's Hot section here and go under book lists and you'll see the newest books for the current month as well as the last month. And we offer the service Your Next Reads and Book Bundles. So if you would like to get personalized book recommendations or if you'd like to get some surprise books checked out to you, you can fill out the form on our website. Just go to Books and Media and then adult book lists to access those forms. And just a last minute note, if you are completing our adult winter reading challenge, you have a few days to get your form in. And the form is on the same page I just mentioned. And you have until the end of the day on February 28th to get that into us. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Shermaine, who is going to be going over adult fiction. Hi, welcome to February Book Buzz. My name is Shereen Burleson and I'm the Tech Services and Cataloging Librarian at Fogelville Public Library. And so we're going to get into some books for the month of February and beyond. The Profits is by Robert Jones Jr. This came out February 5th. So it's about um, basically intimacy and hope and refuge in humanity and humans and um it's kind of reminiscent people have said of like tony morrison's books with um the lyricism and things like that but isaiah and samuel um have to outsmart a slave master and um basically people around them who are like trying to shape life for them and it's not something that they have necessarily wanted for themselves and how inheriting pain and suffering and those types of things um, can be generational, but also that hope and beauty and truth and portraying all these powers that we're instilled in us and love are good things. And so um, this is about that. It's a, another story about um, the layers and the intricacies of slavery. Um, but it's not just about slavery. It's about the slave themselves, the people who are slaves. Um, and so this has been getting good reviews. Uh, Black Buck is a satire about a Black salesman and like this cult-like startup where um, nothing is exactly what it seems. So if you're a fan of Sorry to Bother You or The Wolf of Wall Street, this is kind of like a satirical representation of that. Um, and what the word Black Book actually means is um, it was used during slavery time for the most powerful um, Black man who was a slave. Um, on the plantation and the gold standard of like property, which slaves were. And so that was the term that was used. Um, this author uses it to also explain um, in satire, as I said, how um, Darren just is doing his thing and living his life and how he becomes like, he starts to work at the this startup. So he becomes like the star employee and he's trying to get all these other uh, young people of color to like infiltrate the sales force and do all of these things. But there's a chain of events that changes what happens. So it's a pretty funny, like skewing um, commentation on the workforce of America and it's a very, very good um, story. And that came out January 5th. And it's a, about like the new vision of the American dream and what that means for all of us. Um, Someone Borrowed, Someone Blue is um, 
about um, Mickey Jones, who she has all this childhood trauma and she's planning to kill herself. So she reaches out to this complete stranger for help. And the recipient ends up being this author and childhood sexual abuse survivor, Crystal. And she is convinced that it would have ended up in the spam folder anyway, and no big deal. And so to her surprise, like Crystal answers her back. So this is uh, like an unexpected correspondence or a roller coaster of emotions and them dealing with demons and is it your job to help somebody that is trying to overcome something that you've overcome and how do you do that without damaging or harming yourself and this is the exploration of that so this came out January 7th um yellow wife um is about an enslaved woman who ends up in the Devil's Half Acre, which is this infamous prison in Virginia. And she ends up there. And when she thought she was going to have this wonderful life with um, her, basically on the plantation, because the master sister, she's kind of like, for lack of a better word, um, she is kind of like her, her pet or her prized possession. And something happens. And she's no longer prized anymore. And when she turns 18, instead of living her life with her true love, she is forced to leave the only home she's ever known. And she finds herself in this place and she has to overcome cruelty and all these types of things and um, the contradictions of the enforced cruelty from jailers and other people in the system and to survive, she has to figure out how to survive and face all these challenges and make the ultimate sacrifice. And how do you do that? Like, what does that look like? And these are the things that um, a lot of people did have to think about um, at the time. And it's just an exploration of that, of different things that happen on the plantation, different things that did happen and the struggle and survival of that. Um, the Wandering Sheep is, um, it's a story about, um, do you go with what you know, the flow of things, or do you create something that fits exactly for you? So this is kind of like a mystery or thriller type book about this family. And Jean-Jacques is one of the brothers and he uncovers like all these hidden secrets of the family. And he has to decide if he wants to follow the sheep, the herd, or if he wants to be like a goat and forge on his own. So the African-American folk tale that this is from is about like, Will you change or discover your worldview on your own or will you go with just what everybody else is doing right or wrong and not forge your own path? So this is what this is about. Um, Rod Stream, Nail Cloth is an Afrofuturist book. So Afrofuturist is like a contemporary um, genre that has come about about African and African-American um like the future of the culture, um, things is speculating of what's going to happen, allegories, insights, beliefs in um, pictorial form about like what's going to happen with uh, people, with cultures, with the diaspora. So um, Afrofuturism is one of those things that does that like speculative fiction, but only in the sense of um, just fictionalizing things that people like feel like are actually going to happen and they're really distinctive and this is kind of like sci-fi um as well um sort of fantasy but not as much but just like we're more than what we believe and what others believe us to be and so that's where afrofuturism is going is in like a, a fictionalized explanation of um, nonfiction explanations of just how 
um, African American and and Black and African people are evolving in cultures and as culture and stuff like that. So that's what this is about. Um, and it kind of reminds you of like in the vein of Twilight Zone or um, those types of shows. This is similar to that, but with um, Afro twists. Um, Blood Groove is basically another easy Rollins novel, the newest one. And Walter Mosley comes back with um, some old friends um, and some new ones. And this is about him. Basically, there's a case that he um, picked up that a white Vietnam veteran brought to him. So this is 1969. And he basically, um, him and his girlfriend, the white veteran's girlfriend, were attacked in a citrus grove in the city's outskirts. So he may have killed somebody, but the girl and his dog are missing. And he wants him to take on the case but he realizes that there's some damage that this vet has gone through and they bond over those war experiences type thing. But everything is not always as it seems, of course, in mysteries, it's not. And he's adapting to that and answering questions. And there's like all these unsettling things that he's always had to deal with that he has to face and confront at this time too. So some old friends come back to help him do that. Um, how the one-armed sister sweeps her house. Um, this came out February 2nd as well. And this is about um, classism and interconnected lives and race and class in Barbados. And so um, Lala's grandmother would tell her the story of the one-armed sister. And this is like this cautionary tale about what happens when girls disobey their mothers and go to into the Baxter's tunnels where like everything goes down and all this stuff. So now that Lala has grown and she has a husband and all these different things, um, her husband is kind of like a petty thief and all these stuff, like there's a chain of events with all these things that happen with all these consequences that happen. And um, it's just like, being a woman torn between like both of these worlds and like you're grieving and have grief and there's all this stuff that comes up and like, what will you risk for freedom and life? And for some people, things are like black and white and just clear clap, but for her, it's not. And so this is about, like I said, like interconnected lives, race and classism and all these different things. And this is happening in this resort town. So how, you know, like, gentrification in the Caribbean and like how things are happening and what things come from that good or bad and just a discussion of how that actually affects real people. Um, Here for You by Pat Simmons. Um, this also came out February 2nd. So this is inspirational moment, uh, romance by uh, Pat Simmons. And so this is a hero and a heroine who are better at taking care of other people than themselves. And so they have a crisis of faith and just how do two people who are caregivers for other people give themselves a little TLC? So that's basically what this is about. And neither one of them anticipates what this will mean or what's happening but this is about what happens when you're so good at doing everything for everybody else and somebody comes along and wants to do the same, if not more, for you. Beverly Jenkins is the queen of romance. Um, she is one of the very, very set, established, throned queens. And she is writing this series called The Women Who Dare. So this is about um, a female rancher in Wyoming after the Civil War. And so this reporter comes and he wants to do this story about doctors for his newspaper back East. So he comes West Wyoming and he thinks that this man named Colton Lee will be like this interesting subject. And then he meets her, his sister, whose name is Spring. And the two of them are just attracted to each other. But Spring is not the traditional like wear dresses type of cotillion ball type woman. And she is the exact opposite sort of, of what um, this reporter is used to. 
but they're so attracted to each other and they're pulled into each other that the differences could it be like everlasting love and unite them or could it possibly tear them apart and this is what this is about and so this series is about strong black women um after the civil war and their lives and loves and discoveries so i life after death by silver soldier um she wrote the coldest winter ever and so uh winter went to jail and basically she served her time but there are people who were after her and vengeance and bloodlust and all these types of things are like happening and so will she survive it could you survive it should she survive it because of all the when you do bad things vengeance um does the end justify the means? So if you were ever a fan of the coldest one ever and the character Winter, this is a continuation of that and the journey that it took for her to get to the point that she is after she serves her time. Um, Game of Cones is about a black ice cream owner, ice cream parlor owner named Bronwyn. And this is another, um, the second book in the mystery series. And so um, this is set in Ohio, in this small town in Ohio. And all these things are happening. Her friend gets accused of this murder of this um, guy who comes to town and like wants to, you know, break up small town life and create this mall. And there's a killer on the loose and also family that are trying to take over the family business that was given to her because nobody else really wanted to take it over. And um in the the first book, those things happen and she's become like a more confident owner. But then a family member, her aunt comes up and the rocky relationship between the family and the creamery, like those things kind of come up. But she's going to solve this mystery. She's going to solve this murder. She's going to do all of these things as she does. And she's just going to keep moving forward. And so um, hopefully you'll become a fan of this series like I am too. But this is about... Um, that the conductors um is about underground railroad conductors who also happen to be magic basically they are so this is a, a new voice in fantasy um and the conductors basically help people get to freedom up north um and they used magic and also their wits to do so. So now that the Civil War is over, um, Hetty and her husband, Benji, they settled in Philadelphia. So they're solving murders that white authorities don't care about, don't care to solve. And when they find one of their friends dead, they bury the body and they try to find answers. But the elite Blacks of Philadelphia um, kind of make it hard for them to do that. And they're dredging up all these things that people would rather forget. So they have to face all these things around them, including things about each other that come up. And so this is an original novel. And um, this, if you like speculative fiction, this is like a historical and cultural threading into that about what would happen to the conductors of the Underground Railroad, like after, like what do they transition themselves into? But it's also more than that about having a life after um, a big historical event happens or something happens in your life, big transitions and changes from being that type of person, a savior of people or a champion and like, what do you do on your spare time type thing? Um, apparently solve murder mysteries or mysteries, period. But this is um, a debut novel that's coming out. Um, the Songbook of Benny Lament. So this is a love story about two people who do everything in their power like to be together. And this um, is set in New York in the 60s. And so there's like the mafia involved and like... Um, all these types of things that are happening. So um, there's all these issues that come up about race and the scrutiny of like what the mob means or is in this country. 
and like Benny and Esther are like trying to make music together and do all of these things. And like, even though people may not be ready for the two of them, they are trying to do things on and off stage that matter to them and for each other. And a lot of people have had to deal with those types of things, but this is another story about those types of things. Um, Sorrowland is kind of like a fantasy um, contemporary type fiction. So Vern is like seven months pregnant and she has to escape this strict religious compound and she has her twins and she's in this forest and she's trying to fight this community, this religious community that wants her to go back. But she also has to fight all of these changes that are happening and um, to try to protect her family. Um, she has to face her past, but also um, her future and all these things that she's going to try to do. And she tries to find the truth um, of uncovering secrets of why she fled and all these different things. But it's coupled with like the history of America and how monsters aren't just people, but can be nations of people. And so it's like this seminal book that um, marks the arrival of like a new voice in America, but also what America means on all levels, like the, the good and the bad, but it tells it in a magical realist type of way. And that comes out May 4th. Um, Dead Dead Girls is a debut um, novel from Nakisa Afia. And so it's about the Harlem Renaissance and all these mysteries that are involved in that. And so um, basically, um, Louise works in this cafe in the speakeasy in Harlem. And so she has all of these friends and she was almost, um, well, she did, wasn't almost, she survived this kidnapping when she was young. And she does everything to like, just kind of forget and go on with her life and just maintain like a good life. But people are like telling her like, you gotta like deal with your past. Like maybe you wanna do that. And she kind of ignores all of that until like some, this girl turns up dead in front of the cafe where she works and she's forced to confront things she's been trying to ignore. And so when two more girls get murdered in the past uh, week, like she just kind of, I wouldn't say ignored it. That's not a, a, a good word, but she just like nothing to do with me. So when she gets an altercation with the police, she kind of has to either help them solve it. They're asking for her help because of the situation that she was in when she was a teen or she can just basically go to jail. So she doesn't have a choice. Of course, she decides not to stay in jail. And then she comes like face to face with like basically the serial killer who is not going to stop and how is she going to stop them? So this is the first in that upcoming series. Island Queen is a historical novel based on the real life of Dorothy uh, Caron Thomas, who was a free woman of color that rose from slavery to become one of the wealthiest landowners in the West Indies. And so this is about like how she bought her freedom and like a fictionalized account of that, how she bought her freedom. Um, and those types of things, like the, the, her life, basically, and the realities of slavery and colonialism and working within the system to try to make things and the system that you're working within is part of the reason why you were a slave and all these things that like um, can come up from that. And so it's also about like women of color as well and like the oppression that they have to deal with in order to be successful and like overcoming that. And so um, she was a larger than life woman who made history in the Caribbean. And so this is just like this historical novel is based on basically her life. Um, Razor Blade Tears. So this is the second um, book that Sekobi wrote about. Um, so this is about two fathers and two murdered sons in vengeance. And 
What does that mean? And when you seek vengeance, like, could there be not just justice, but like even redemption from your past wrongs or your sins or in justifying the means? There's all of it wrapped up in all of this. And so this is what Razor Blade Tears is about. Um, in Every Mirror, She's Black. This is a novel by a, um, well, she's actually like a Black Swedish woman. And she also writes this story about like these three women and what it means to be Black women in the world, period, no matter where you are. And so like these Black women are linked to like the same white man in Stockholm, Sweden. And like <laughs> the layers of like all these things that it not only means to be a black woman, like, well, what it means to be a black woman anywhere and the layers and the nuances of that and how you're portrayed um, as such. And so it's told through these three women's perspective. And so it's very fast paced and um, it's also a contemporary fiction and it touches on important social issues, uh, fetishization, racism, classism, tokenism, and what it means when you're a black woman navigating white dominated like society. Um, and it's a conversation that needs to be had, will be had. Um, so this is by, like I said, a Nigerian born, but she is a Swedish citizen now and speaker and a photographer. Um, and this is her first novel. We love to hear from you, of course. This is my contact information. Um, send me emails about like books you're interested in, um, things that I may have not covered here that you would really like. Um, always looking forward to feedback or new discoveries um, for myself to find. And so please don't hesitate to contact us and see you at the next book buzz. Bye. Okay, I'm going to be sharing some new nonfiction with you as well as some books that are coming out in the next few months. We're going to start with Black Futures, edited by Kimberly Drew and Jenna Wortham. This came out in December. Kimberly Drew and Jenna Wortham have brought together this collection of work, images, photos, essays, memes, dialogues, recipes, tweets, poetry, and more, to tell the story of the radical, imaginative, provocative, and gorgeous world that Black creators are bringing forth today. In answering the question of what it means to be Black and alive, Black Futures opens a prismatic vision of possibility for every reader. Next, we have I Came as a Shadow, an autobiography by John Thompson. John Thompson was never just a basketball coach, and I Came as a Shadow is categorically not just a basketball autobiography. After three decades at the center of race and sports in America, the first black head coach to win an NCAA championship makes the private public at last. Chock full of stories and moving beyond mere stats, Thompson's book drives us through his childhood under Jim Crow segregation to our current moment of racial reckoning. This is a great American story, and John Thompson's experience sheds light on many of the issues roiling our nation. In these pages, a last gift from Coach, he proves himself to be the elder statesman whose final words college basketball and the country need to hear. I Came as a Shadow is not a swan song, but a bullhorn blast from one of America's most prominent sons. Huddle up. And next we have Black First by Jesse Carney Smith. Revel and rejoice in the renowned and lesser known barrier breaking trailblazers in all fields, arts, entertainment, business, civil rights, education, government, invention, journalism, religion, science, sports, music, and more. Learn about the first African-American Olympian, the first black pilot for a scheduled commercial airline, the first recorded slave revolt in North America, the first African-American cookbook writer, and many, many more. Expanded, updated, and revised for the first time in over eight years, Black First collects more than 500 all new achievements and previously unearthed firsts. This massive tome proves that African-American accomplishments are wide ranging and ongoing, documenting thousands of personal victories and triumphs. Next we have Baseball's Leading Lady, Effa Manley and the Rise and Fall of the Negro Leagues by Andrea Williams. Before Jackie Robinson broke Major League Baseball's color barrier in 1947, Black athletes played in the Negro Leagues on teams coached by black managers, cheered on by black fans, and often run by black owners. 
Here's a riveting true story of the woman at the center of the black baseball world, Effa Manley, co-owner and business manager of the Newark Eagles. Elegant yet gutsy, she cultivated a powerhouse team. Yet just as her Eagles reached their pinnacle, so did calls to integrate baseball, a move that would all but extinguish the Negro Leagues. On and off the field, Effa hated to lose. She had devoted her life to black empowerment, but in the battle for black baseball, was the game rigged against her? Andrea Williams is baseball's leading lady is the powerful true story of Effa Manley, the first and only woman inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Next, we have Aftershocks, a memoir. Young Nadia Owusu followed her father, a United Nations official, from Europe to Africa and back again. Just as she and her family settled into a new home, her father would tell them it was time to say their goodbyes. The instability wrought by Nadia's nomadic childhood was deepened by family secrets and fractures, both lived and inherited. Her Armenian-American mother, who abandoned Nadia when she was two, would periodically reappear only to vanish again. Her father, a Ghanaian, the great hero of her life, died when she was 13. After his passing, Nadia's stepmother weighed her down with a revelation that was either a bombshell secret or a lie, rife with shaming innuendo. With these and other ruptures, Nadia arrived in New York City as a young woman fleeing, feeling stateless, motherless, and uncertain about her future, yet eager to find her own identity. What followed, however, were periods of depression in which she struggled to hold herself and her siblings together. Aftershocks is the way she hauled herself from the wreckage of her life's perpetual quaking, a means by which she has finally come to understand that the only ground firm enough to count on is the one written into existence by her own hand. And next we have Just As I Am by Cicely Tyson. And this was released just days before Cicely Tyson passed away. She was a pioneering actor who gained an Oscar nomination for her role as the sharecropper's wife in Sounder and won a Tony Award in 2013 at the age of 88 for her work in The Trip to Bountiful. She won two Emmys and five more nominations, including one just last year for playing the mother of Viola Davis's character in the ABC drama, How to Get Away with Murder. Instead of the typical synopsis, I'll read you a description in the author's own words. Just as I am is my truth. It is me, plain and unvarnished, with the glitter and garland set aside. In these pages, I am indeed Cicely, the actress who has been blessed to grace the stage and screen for six decades. Yet I am also the church girl who once rarely spoke a word. I am the teenager who sought solace in the verses of the old hymn for which this book is named. I am a daughter and a mother, a sister and a friend. I am an observer of human nature and the dreamer of audacious dreams. I am a woman who has hurt as immeasurably as I have loved, a child of God divinely guided by his hand. And here in my ninth decade, I am a woman who at long last has something meaningful to say. Next we have The Devil You Know, A Black Power Manifesto by Charles M. Blow. Acclaimed columnist and author Charles Blow never wanted to write a race book, but his violence against black people, both physical and psychological, seemed only to increase in recent years, culminating in the historic pandemic and protests of the summer of 2020. He felt compelled to write a new story for black Americans. He envisioned a succinct, counterintuitive and impassioned corrective to the myths that have far too long governed our thinking about race and geography in America. Drawing on both political observations and personal experience as a black son of the South, Charles sets out to offer a call to action by which black people can finally achieve equality on their own terms. Next, we have the three mothers, how the mothers of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and James Baldwin shaped a nation by Anna Malika Tubbs. Bertus Baldwin, Alberta King, and Louise Little were all born at the beginning of the 20th century and forced to contend with the prejudices of Jim Crow as black women. These three extraordinary women passed their knowledge to their children with the hope of helping them to survive in a society that would deny their humanity from the very beginning. From Louise teaching her children about their activist roots to Bertus encouraging James to express himself through writing to Alberta basing all of her lessons in faith and social justice. These women use their strength and motherhood to push their children toward greatness, all with the conviction that every human being deserves dignity and respect despite the rampant discrimination they faced. These women, their similarities and differences as individuals and as mothers represent a piece of history left untold and a celebration of black motherhood long overdue. Next we have Floating in a Most Peculiar Way, a memoir. 
by Louis Chudasoke. The first time the author realizes that he is the first son of the first son of a renowned religious leader of the bygone African nation of Biafra is in Uncle Daddy and Big Auntie's strict religious household in Jamaica, where he lives with his other with other abandoned children. A visiting African has just fallen to his knees to shake him by the shoulders and says, is this the boy? Is this him? Chusoke's immersion, immersion in the politics of race and belonging across the landscape of the African diaspora takes a turn when his traumatized mother, who has her own extraordinary history as the one-time Jackie O of Biafra, finally sends for him to come live with her. In Inglewood, Los Angeles, on the eve of gangster rap and the LA riots, it's as if he's fallen to earth. In this world, anything alien, definitely his secret obsession with science fiction and David Bowie is in danger, and his yearning to become a black American gets deeply, sometimes absurdly complicated. Ultimately, it is a boisterous Pan-African family of honorary aunts, uncles, and cousins that becomes his secret society, teaching him the redemptive skill of navigating not just blackness, but blackness says in his America. Four Hundred Souls: A Community History of African America, 1619 to 2019, edited by Ibram X. Kendi and Keisha N. Blaine. The story begins in 1619, a year before the Mayflower, when the White Lion disgorges, quote, some twenty and odd Negroes, unquote, onto the shores of Virginia, inaugurating the African presence in what would become the United States. It takes us to the present when African Americans, descendants of those on the White Lion, and a thousand other routes to this country. Continue a journey defined by inhuman oppression, visionary struggles, stunning achievements, and millions of ordinary lives passing through extraordinary history. 400 Souls is a unique one-volume community history of African Americans. The editors have assembled 90 brilliant writers, each of whom takes on a five-year period of that 400-year span. The writers explore their periods through a variety of techniques, and they approach history from various perspectives. This collection of diverse pieces fundamentally de deconstructs the idea that Africans in America are a monolith. Instead, it unlocks the startling range of experiences and ideas that have always existed within the community of Blackness. This is a history that illuminates our past and gives us new ways of thinking about our future, written by the most vital and essential voices of our present. Next, we have Crossing the Line, a fearless team of brothers and the sport that changed their lives forever by Kareem Rosser. Born and raised in West Philadelphia, Kareem thought he and his siblings would always be stuck in the bottom, a community and neighborhood devastated by poverty and violence. Riding their bicycles through Philly's Fairmount Park, Kareem's brothers discover a barn full of horses. Noticing the brothers' fascination with her misfit animals, Leslie Heiner, founder of the Work to Ride Stables, offers them an escape an after-school job in exchange for riding lessons. What starts as an accidental discovery turns into a love for horseback riding that leads the Rossers to discovering their passion for polo. Pursuing the sport with determination and discipline, Kareem earns his place among the typically exclusive players in college, becoming part of the first all-black national interscholastic polo championship team, all while struggling to keep his family together. Crossing the line is the story of bonds and brotherhood, family loyalty, the transformative connection between man and horse, and forging a better future that comes from overcoming impossible odds. Next we have Vibrate Higher, a rap story by Talib Kweli. Before Talib Kweli became a world-renowned hip-hop artist, he was a Brooklyn kid who liked to cut class, spit rhymes, and wander the streets of Greenwich Village with a motley crew of artists, rappers, and DJs who found hip hop more inspiring than their textbooks. Quilly's was the first generation to grow up with hip hop as established culture, a genre of music that has expanded to include its own pantheon of heroes, rich history and politics, and distinct worldview. Eventually, childhood friendships turned into collaborations and Quilly gained notoriety as a rapper in his own right. From collaborating with some of hip hop's greatest, including Mos Def, Common, Kanye West, Pharrell Williams, and Kendrick Lamar, to selling his books out of the oldest African-American bookstore in Brooklyn, and ultimately leaving his record label and taking control of his own recording career. Quilly tells a winding, always compelling story of the people and events that shaped his own life, as well as the culture of hip hop, which informs American culture at large. Next, we have The Black Church, This Is Our Story, This Is Our Song by Henry Louis Gates Jr. 
For the young Henry Louis Gates Jr., growing up in a small, segregated West Virginia town, the church was his family and his community's true center of gravity. Within those walls, voices were lifted up and sung to call forth the best in each other, and to comfort each other when times were at their worst. In this book, Gates takes us from his own experience onto a journey across more than 400 years and spanning the entire country. At Road's End, we emerge with a new understanding of the centrality of the Black church to the American story. As a cultural and political force, as the center of resistance to slavery and white supremacy, as an unparalleled incubator of talent, and as a crucible for working through the community's most important issues down to today. As Gates brilliantly shows, the Black church has never been one thing, its story lies at the vital center of the civil rights movement and produced many of its leaders from the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. on. But at the same time, there have always been churches and sects that issued a more activist stance, even issued worldly political engagement altogether. That tension can be felt all the way to the Black Lives Matter movement and the work of today. Still in all, as a source of strength and force for change, the Black church is at the center of the action at every stage of the American story as this enthralling history makes vividly clear. Next, we have Raceless, In Search of Family, Identity, and the Truth About Where I Belong by Georgina Lawton. Raised in St. Pete, English suburbia, Georgina was no stranger to homogeneity. Her parents were white, her friends were white, there was no reason for her to think she was any different. But over time, her brown skin and dark kinky hair frequently made her a target of prejudice. In Georgina's insistently colorblind household, with no knowledge of her differences or access to black culture, she lacked the coordinates to make sense of who she was. It was only after her father's death that Georgina began to unravel the truth about her parentage and the racial identity that she had been denied. She fled from England and the turmoil of her home life to live in black communities across the globe and to explore her identity and what it meant to live in and navigate the world as a black woman. She spoke with psychologists, sociologists, experts in genetic testing, and other individuals whose experiences of racial identity have been fraught or questioned in the hopes of understanding how exactly we identify ourselves. Raceless is an exploration of a fundamental question. What constitutes our sense of self? Lawton grapples with difficult questions about love, shame, grief, and prejudice, and reveals the nuanced and emotional journey of forming one's identity. Next, we have The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space Time, and Dreams Deferred by Chandra Prescott Weinstein. In The Disordered Cosmos, Dr. Prescott Weinstein shares her love for physics, from the standard model of particle physics and what lies beyond it, to the physics of melanin and skin, to the latest theories of dark matter, all with a new spin informed by history, politics, and the wisdom of Star Trek. One of the leading physicists of her generation, She's also one of fewer than 100 Black American women to earn a PhD from a department of physics. Her vision of the cosmos is vibrant, buoyantly non-traditional, and grounded in Black feminist traditions. She lays out a bold new approach to science and society that begins with the belief that we all have a fundamental right to know and love the night sky. And we have Black Girl Call Home by Jasmine Manns. From spoken word poet Jasmine Manns comes an unforgettable poetry collection about race, feminism, and queer identity. With echoes of Gwendolyn Brooks, Gwendolyn Brooks and Sonia Sanchez, Manns writes to call herself and us home. Each poem explores what it means to be a daughter of Newark and America and the painful, joyous path to adulthood as a young queer black woman. Black Girl Call Home is a love letter to the wandering black girl and a vital companion to any woman on a journey to find truth, belonging, and healing. Next is Economy Hall, The Hidden History of a Free Black Brotherhood by Fatima Sheikh. The story begins with the author's father rescuing a century's worth of handwritten journals in French from a trash hauler's pickup truck. From the journal's pages emerged one of the most important multi-ethnic intellectual communities in the U.S. South. Educators, world traveling merchants, soldiers, tradesmen, and poets. Although Louisiana law classified them as men of color, Negroes, and Blacks, the Economy Brothers rejected racism and colorism to fight for suffrage and education rights for all. In the face of an oppressive white society, members of the Société d'Economie et d'Assistance Mutuelle, or Society of Econo Economy and Mutual Assistance, built a community and held it together through the era of slavery, the Civil War, Reconstruction, and Jim Crow terrorism. Economy Hall fo follows Ledger Bogie, her his family, 
and friends through landmark events from the Haitian Revolution to the birth of jazz that shaped New Orleans and the United States. A descendant of the economy's community, author Fatima Sheikh has constructed a meticulously detailed nonfiction narrative that reads like an epic novel. Next we have We Are Each Other's Harvest by Natalie Bazile. From the author of Queen Sugar, now a critically acclaimed series on o Own, directed by Ava DuVernay, comes beautiful exploration and celebration of black farming in America. In this impressive anthology, Natalie Bazile brings together essays, poems, photographs, quotes, conversations, and first person stories to examine black people's connection to the American land from emancipation to today. In the 1920s, there were over 1 million black farmers. Today, there are just 45,000. Bazile explores this crisis through the farmers' personal experiences. In their own words, middle-aged and elderly black farmers explain why they continue to farm despite systemic discrimination and land loss. The returning generation, young farmers who are building upon the legacy of their ancestors, talk about the challenges they face as they seek to redress issues of food justice, food sovereignty, and reparations. We Are Each Other's Harvest elevates the voices and stories of black farmers and people of color, celebrating their perseverance and resilience while spotlighting the challenges they continue to face. Luminous and eye-opening, this eclectic collection helps people and communities of color today reimagine what it means to be dedicated to the soil. And next we have A Little Devil in America, Notes in Praise of Black Performance by Anif Abdurraki. At the March on Washington in 1963, Josephine Baker was 57 years old, well beyond her most prolific days. But in her speech, she was in a mood to consider her life, her legacy, her departure from the country she was now triumphantly returning to. I was a devil in other countries, and I was a little devil in America, too, she told the crowd. Inspired by these few words, Hanif Abdurraqib has written a profound and lasting reflection on how Black performance is inextricably woven into the fabric of American culture. Each moment in every performance he examines, whether it's the 20 seconds in Gimme Shelter, in which Mary Clayton wails, a, school, a schoolyard fist fight, a dance marathon, or the instant in a game of spades right after the cards are dealt, has layers of resonance in black and white cultures, the politics of American empire, and Abdurraqib's own personal history of love, grief, and performance. A Little Devil in America exalts the black performance that unfolds in specific moments in time and space, from mid-century Paris to the moon, and back down again to a cramped living room in Columbus, Ohio. Next, we have Buses Are Coming, Memoir of a Freedom Writer by Charles Person. At 18, Charles Person was the youngest of the original freedom writers. This purposeful mix of black and white male and female activists set out to discover whether America would abide by a Supreme Court decision that ruled segregation unconstitutional in bus depots, waiting areas, restaurants, and rest restrooms worldwide. The freedom writers found their answer. No, Southern states would continue to disregard federal law and use violence to enforce racial segregation. One bus was burned to a shell. The second, which Charles, which Charles rode, was set upon by a mob that beat the riders nearly to death. Buses Are Coming provides a front row view of the struggle to belong in America. As Charles leads his colleagues off the bus, into the station, into the mob, and into history to help defeat segregation's violent grip on African American lives. It is also a challenge from a teenager of a previous era to the young people of today. Become agents of transformation. Stand firm. Create a more just and moral country where students have a voice, youth can make a difference, and everyone belongs. Next we have Sure I'll Be Your Back Black Friend, Notes from the Other Side of the Fist Bump by Ben Phillippe. In an era in which I have many black friends is often a medal of wokeness, Ben hilariously chronicles the experience of being on the receiving end of those fist bumps. Ben takes his role as your new black friend seriously, providing original and borrowed wisdom on stereotypes, slurs, the whole swimming thing, how much Beyonce is too much Beyonce, black girl magic, affirmative action, the Black Lives Matter movement, and other conversations you might want to have with your new BBFF. Oscillating between the impulse to be one of the good ones and the occasional need to excuse himself to the restrooms, stuff his mouth with toilet paper and scream. Ben navigates his own blackness as a quote unquote Oreo with too many opinions for his father's liking, an encyclopedic knowledge of CW teen dramas and a mouth he can't always control. 
Extremely timely, Sure I'll Be Your Black Friend is a conversational take on topics both light and heavy, universal and deeply personal, which reveals incisive truths about the need for connection in all of us. Next, we have Better Not Bitter, Living on Purpose in the Pursuit of Racial Justice by Yusuf Salam. They didn't know who they had. So begins Yusuf Salam's telling his story. No one's life is the sum of the worst thing that happened to them. And during Yusuf Salam's seven years of wrongful incarceration as one of the Central Park Five, he grew from child to man and gained a spiritual perspective on life. Better Not Bitter is the first time that one of the now exonerated five is telling his individual story in his own words. Yusuf writes his narrative. Growing up black in central Harlem in the 80s, being raised by a strong, fierce mother and grandmother, his years of incarceration, his reentry and exoneration. Yusuf connects these stories to lessons and principles he learned that gave him power to survive through the worst of life's experiences. He inspires readers to accept their own path, to understand their own sense of purpose, with his intimate personal insights, Yusuf unpacks the systems built and designed for profit and the oppression of black and brown people. He inspires readers to channel their fury into action and through the spiritual to turn that anger and trauma into a constructive force that lives alongside accountability and mobilizes change. This memoir is an inspiring story that grew out of one of the gravest miscarriages of justice, one that not only speaks to a moment in time or the rage-filled present, but reflects a 400 year history of a nation's inability to be held accountable for its sins. Yusuf Salam's message is vital for our times, a motivating resource for enacting change. Better Not Bitter has the power to soothe, inspire, and transform. It is a galvanizing call to action. Next we have Footnotes, The Black Artists Who Wrote the Rules of the Great White Way by Cassine Gaines. For readers of Hidden Figures and Something Wonderful, Footnotes is the story of New York in the Roaring Twenties and the very first Broadway show with an all-black cast and creative team to succeed, and the indelible mark on our popular culture. These pioneering performer and the creator sowed the seeds of the Harlem jazz scene and paved the way for people of color on stage and screen with West Side Story, Black Panther, and of course Hamilton. Importantly, this book illuminates the ways in which Black people in America have attained success amidst the culture actively whitewashing, controlling, or completely preventing their stories from being told. And finally, we have Katherine Johnson's book, My Remarkable Journey, a Memoir. In 2015, at the age of 97, Katherine Johnson became a global celebrity. President Barack Obama awarded her the prestigious Presidential Medal of Freedom the nation's highest civilian honor for her pioneering work as a mathematician on NASA's first flights into space. Her contributions to America's space program were celebrated in the blockbuster and Academy Award nominated movie, Hidden Figures. In this memoir, Catherine shares her personal journey from child prodigy in the Galle Allegheny Mountains of West Virginia to NASA human computer. Infused with the uplifting wisdom of a woman who handled great fame with genuine humility and great tragedy with enduring hope, my Remarkable journey, journey ultimately brings into focus a determined woman who navigated through racial terrain with soft, broken grace and the unrelenting grit required to make history and inspire future generations. And here are some more books um, that we featured in our last couple of book buzzes. So in case you missed those, you may want to go back through our YouTube channel to check those out. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions or requests, please email me at bettym at pflugervilletx.gov. That's B-E-T-T-E-M at P-F-L-U-G-E-R-V-I-L-L-E-T-X dot G-O-V. Hello. For this month's book buzz, I'm going to share some titles we already have in the library collection, some titles I've had on the list of things to order, and a few titles we look forward to this year. These are books we'll be adding to the adult graphic novel area of our collection, but don't forget that if graphic novel is your preferred format or one you're willing to explore, you will find excellent titles in the graphic novel or juvenile graphic novel areas, so don't be afraid to look. For anyone interested, one of the resources I used is the Black Caucus of the American Library Association and Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtables Black Lives Matter Comics Reading List, which does include titles for all ages. Criteria for inclusion on the list were that the title must be published sequential art with one or more of the following elements. 
created by a black storyteller, displays empathy and respect for black bodies, introduces readers to black art, people, history, organizations, and communities, represents black experiences both domestically and throughout the world, showcases a diversity of artistic mediums, includes the lived experiences of black people from all demographics, reinforces black stories of success, resistance, endurance, and love, employs a wide array of genres, demonstrates an understanding of cultural nuance, represents independent and non-traditional publishing, includes stories of ancient black civilizations as well as black people's continued existence in the future, improves access to authentic black stories for all patrons, and exposes black creators to wider audiences. I highly recommend checking out the full list. Let's get started with some books from the past few years. First, Incognito, a graphic mystery, out February of 2018 from Burger Books, is a 10th anniversary edition of the acclaimed graphic novel. In the early 20th century, Zane Pinchback, a reporter for the New Holland Herald, is sent to investigate the arrest of his own brother, charged with the brutal murder of a white woman in Mississippi. With the lynch mob already swarming, Zane, whose skin color is light enough that he can pass for white, must stay incognito long enough to uncover the truth behind the murder to save his brother and himself. Suspenseful, unsettling, and relevant, Incognito is a tense graphic novel of shifting identities, forbidden passions, and secrets that run far deeper than skin color. Followed by a prequel miniseries, Incognito Renaissance, out in October of 2018, also from Berger, is a page-turning thriller of racial divide that explores segregation, secrets, and self-image as our race-bending protagonist penetrates a world where he feels stranger than ever before. When a black writer is found dead at a scandalous interracial party in 1920s New York, Harlem's cub reporter Zane Pinchback is the only one determined to solve the murder. Zane must go incognito for the first time, using his light appearance to pass as a white man to find the true killer. With a cryptic manuscript as his only clue and a mysterious and beautiful woman as, his, as the murderer's only witness, Zane finds himself on the hunt through the dark and dangerous streets of Roaring Twenties Harlem in search for justice. In a time when looks could kill, Zane's skin is the only thing keeping him alive. Next, Abbott, also out October of 2018 from Boom Studios. While investigating police brutality and corruption in 1970s Detroit, journalist Elena Abbott uncovers supernatural forces being controlled by a secret society of the city's elite. In the uncertain social and political climate of 1972 Detroit, hard-nosed, chain-smoking tabloid reporter Elena Abbott investigates a series of grisly crimes that the police have ignored crimes she knows to be the work of dark occult forces, forces that took her husband from her, forces she has sworn to destroy. Hugo Award-nominated novelist Saladin Ahmed and artist Sami Kila present one woman's search for the truth that destroyed her family amidst an exploration of the systemic societal constructs that haunt our country to this day. Here we have the banks, out in December of 2019 from TKO Studios, by New York Times bestselling writer Roxane Gay and artist Ming Doyle. The Banks is a heist thriller about the most successful thieves in Chicago, the women of the Banks family. For 50 years, the women of the Banks family have been the most successful thieves in Chicago by following one simple rule, never get greedy. But when the youngest bank stumbles upon the heist of a lifetime, the potential windfall may be enough to bring three generations of thieves together for one incredible score and the chance to avenge a loved one taken too soon. In case you haven't heard, The Banks is becoming a movie. TKO Studios has partnered with Macro, whose films have garnered nine honor Oscar nominations and one Oscar win for Viola Davison Fences, to produce a film adaption of Gay is set to write the script and will also serve as executive producer. This is a title I've included in our grant proposal for the Jeanette and Jim Larson Mystery Grant through the Texas Library Association. Next, The Wilds, also out in December of 2019 from Black Mass Comics. 
After a cataclysmic plague sweeps across America, survivors come together to form city-state-like communities for safety. Daisy Walker is a runner for the compound, a mix of post-apocalyptic postal service and black market salvaging operation. It's a runner's job to ferry items and people between settlements, and on occasion, scavenge through the ruins of the old world. Daisy is the best there is at what she does. Out beyond the settlement walls are innumerable dangers, feral animals, crumbling structures, and abominations, those that were touched by the plague and became something other. After a decade of surviving, Daisy isn't fazed by any of it, until her lover, another runner named Heather, goes missing on a job. Desperate to find her, Daisy begins to see that there may be little difference between the world inside the walls and the horrors beyond. From writer Vita Ayala and Emily Pearson, with a cover by Natasha Alterici, comes this bold tale of surviving in bleak times. Moving into 2020, we got Parable of the Sower in January from Abrams. The follow-up to the number one New York Times bestseller, Kindred, a graphic novel, Adaption is this graphic novel adaption of Octavia E. Butler's groundbreaking dystopian novel, Parable of the Sower, by Damian Duffy and John Jennings, the award-winning team behind Kindred. The author portrays a searing vision of America's future. In the year 2024, the country is marred by unattended environmental and economic crises that lead to social chaos. Lauren Olamina, a preacher's daughter living in Los Angeles, is protected from danger by the walls of her gated community. However, in a night of fire and death, what begins as a fight for survival soon leads to something much more, a startling vision of human destiny and the birth of a new faith. Last in this section, I'd like to highlight a replacement copy for this beauty, Black Comics Returns, first released in February of 2018, it got a reprint in March of 2020 by Magnetic Press. In 2010, Professor John Jennings and Dr. Damian Duffy compiled and published a 176-page collection of art and essays celebrating the vibrant African-American independent comics community. Black Comics featured over 50 contributors. It met high praise throughout the industry and quickly sold through its respectable print run, despite interest and demand. Used copies now fetch $60 to $150 on Amazon and eBay. Flash forward eight years, the comic industry has changed a lot since then, and the amount of African-American talent continues to grow and amaze. While huge strides in diversity have been made, John and Damien felt the time was right for another spotlight on the topic. Rather than simply reprinting the first edition, considering the number of fresh new voices and changes in the industry, a whole new volume felt necessary. This massive volume will be a brand new milestone spotlight on the amazing diversity in comics today. And now I'd like to highlight some ongoing series. First two that will be familiar from previous book buzzes, but as a reminder, we have Farmhand. Volumes one through three are out now from Rob Guillory, Eisner winning co-creator and artist of Image Comics Chew, a dark comedy about science gone sinister and agriculture gone apocalyptic. Nature is a mother. Jedediah Jenkins is a farmer, but his cash crop isn't corn or soy. Jed grows fast healing, plug and play, human organs. Lose a finger? Need a new liver? He's got you covered. Unfortunately, strange produce isn't the only thing Jed's got buried. Deep in the soil of the Jenkins family farm, Something dark has taken root, and it's beginning to bloom. And the Bitterroot series. Volume 1 Family Business in May of 2019 introduced us to the Sangiri family, specialized in curing the souls of those infected by hate. But those days are fading. A terrible tragedy has claimed most of the family, leaving the surviving cousins split between curing monsters and killing them. Now with a new breed of monster loose on the streets of Harlem, the family must come together or watch the human race fall to untold evil. In volume two from October of 2020, Image Comics gave us more of the monster hunting that has been the Sangri family for business for generations as they battle the Jinnu. 
hideous creatures born out of hate and racism. But now the family faces a different threat, the deadly Inzondo, a new kind of monster born out of grief and trauma. With one of their own turning into an Inzondo and an army of tortured souls on the attack in 1920s Harlem, the family must once more fight again to save the world unless their own pain and suffering transforms them into monsters as well. And two series we've recently added. First up, Omni. Volume 1, The Doctor is In, came September of 2020 from H1, which we have already. What would you do if you could think faster than the speed of light? Gifted doctor Cecilia Cobina was once held in the highest regard by peers and patients alike, but that was before an incident in Africa changed her life forever. Now with the ability to process thoughts at the speed of light, she faces the unimaginable burden of literally having an answer for everything. As the truth of her origin slowly comes into focus, Cecilia must overcome her fears and tackle the one mystery she can't seem to crack, the truth behind her new abilities. Written by fan favorite author Devin Grayson, Dr. Cecilia Cobbins bursts onto the scene as the world's newest favorite female hero. Just the, earlier this month, we got volume two, where a young African-American doctor suddenly had the mysterious, suddenly and mysteriously gains incredible abilities that put her at the forefront of human evolution. Dr. Cabina, able to think at the speed of light and instantly diagnose any situation, heads an enigmatic corporation known only as Omni, giving her the resources she needs to search for others like her. She's on a quest to learn the origin of her new powers, but along the way, discovers that the fate of the entire world may rest on her shoulders. In this series, Tartarus, Volume 1 from October of 2020, when Circa, a ruthless criminal warlord, escapes her prison pit, she unleashes a wave of destruction that ripples across Tartarus, a vital colony in an everlasting galactic war. Years later, when Tilda, a young cadet, learns that she's Circa's daughter, will she continue to fight on the side of galactic order or reclaim her mother's dark crown? Volume 2 will be out in May of this year. The stakes are turned up all the way when blood enemies Circa and Hisa are stranded together on a mysterious far-off world. Can they survive an epic journey across space and time, fraught with pleasures and peril? Can they survive each other? Guest artist Andrew Cranky joins regular artist Jack T. Cole on this high-octane story arc. And to close out today's series, here are two volume twos for series I've highlighted recently. Philadelphia Volume 2 will be out April 6th of this year, continuing the critically acclaimed sold-out series from breakout star Rodney Barnes, the writer behind such hit shows as Wu-Tang and American Saga and Stars' American Gods, and the artist who redefined Spawn, Jason Sean Alexander. Adams's battle to reshape the United States in his own twisted vision might have been thwarted for now, giving Jimmy Sangster a moment of respite. But the war for a new America rages on. Now as Abigail steps out of the shadows, she unleashes a new violent terror upon the city some have renamed Philadelphia. But this time, it's about creating as widespread a web of fear imaginable as she rips the beating heart from the city itself. Can Jimmy stop her or will history repeat and force him to meet the same fate as his father? This title is being developed into a TV series. And Excellence Volume 2 will be out in May 18th of this year. Spencer Dales was born into a world of magic. His father belongs to the Aegis, a secret society of black magicians ordered by their unseen masters to better the lives of others of higher potential, but never themselves. Now Spencer Dales has one purpose, tear down the Aegis and free everyone under their protection. However, with his closest ally in prison, the tenth and the tenth looking to put Spence in an adjoining cell, creating a better future won't be easy, but it needs to happen now. Kari Randolph and Brandon Thomas ignite a generational war in this action fantasy series made entirely by creators of color and committed to one truth above all, 
excellence is real. Now on to some new and notable titles. Another title on our Larson Mystery Grant list is The Question, The Deaths of Vic Sage from November of 2020 in DC Comics. Eisner winning writer Jeff Lemire joins forces with the legendary art team of Dennis Cohen and Bill Sienkiewicz to resurrect Vic Sage, only to destroy him all over again and again. For years, Vic Sage has worn the faceless mask of the question to clean up the streets of Hub City by sheer force of will. He knows right from wrong. He knows black from white. But what happens when he is drawn into a conspiracy that reaches from the heights of Hub City power to the depths of its underground tunnels? What happens when things stop being black and white and start getting a little gray? And what happens when, in a secret chamber deep beneath the city, Vic Sage meets his own end? and his new beginning. Black, Widow, Black AF Widows and Orphans from December 2020 in Black Mass Comics. In a world where only black people have superpowers, what price do they fetch on the black market? From the pages of Black, this new story features Anasi and Hoodrat investigating a human trafficking ring that will take them across the globe and bring them face to face with dark pasts of abuse, child soldiers, and families torn apart. After the rain, out in January from Harry N. Abrams, during a furious storm, a young woman's destiny is revealed and her life is changed forever. After the rain is a graphic novel adaption of Nettie Okorafor's short story, On the Road. The drama takes place in a small Nigerian town during a violent and unexpected storm. A Nigerian-American woman named Chioma answers a knock at her door and is horrified to see a boy with a severe head wound standing at her doorstep. He reaches for her and his touch burns like fire. Something is very wrong. Haunted and hunted, Chioma must embrace her heritage in order to survive. John Jennings and David Brame's graphic novel collaboration uses bold art and colors to powerfully tell this tale of identity and destiny. Um, I saw in Nettie in a author event recently, and when she was asked if her book Remote Control could be described as both magical realism and African futurism, she said yes, but magical realism can be problematic as it is a label often given to non-Western cultures, labeling people's worldview as magical because it's not a Western worldview. African futurism is basically science fiction deeply rooted in African culture, politics, people, beliefs, which brings worldview, not othering, to the mystical things of the world. Tor published an article on this which said that doesn't mean that the stories have to take place explicitly on the continent of Africa, but that the themes, characters, and roots of the story are based in Africa and not in America or another predominantly white Western culture. Afrofuturism, on the other hand, is also a subcategory of science fiction concerning black people within the diaspora that often features stories from outside the continent of Africa and usually in colonized Western societies like America, Canada, and the UK. In a similar vein, Afrofuturism, a movement that began in the black community during the early 20th century as an escape from racial hostility, economic turmoil, and aggressive policing, is enjoying a renaissance witnessed by the record-breaking successes of creative projects. Like this one. We get to Afrofuturist Tim Fielder's beautifully written and rendered Infinitum, which was out in January from Amistad, which is an imprint of HarperCollins. In Infinitum, King Aja Oba and Queen Lewa are revered across the African continent for their impressive political and military skills. Yet the future of their kingdom is in jeopardy, for the royal couple do not have an heir of their own. When the king kidnaps his son born to a concubine, Obinrin curses Oba with the gift of immortality. After enjoying long, wonderful lives, both Queen Liwa and the crown prince die naturally, leaving the ageless, bereaved King Oba, heartbroken and alone. Taking advantage of Oba's vulnerability, enemy nations rise to power and kill the king, or so they think. King Aja Oba survives the fatal attack, finally realizing the bitter fruit of Obenrin's curse. Earlier this month, we also got a 
Black AF Devils Die from Black Mass Comics. This latest Black AF collected miniseries is written by breakout star Vita Ayala and rising star artist Liana Kanga. When a new drug called Vanta hits the streets, word is it's the hottest thing since ecstasy. For regular people, it has all the highs and none of the lows of traditional drugs. There is some fine print, however. For empowered black folks, the drug causes a total and violent loss of control. The project sends Indigo to investigate, and soon it becomes apparent that this is more than just a new designer distraction for the masses. Indigo, together with former detective Ellen Waters, race to find the source of the substance poisoning their people before it's too late. The superhero universe where only black people have superpowers continues to expand for the first time with a new creative team building onto the exciting world. Finishing off with some titles to look forward to going forward in 2021. In May of this year, we'll get Black Star from Abrams Comics. Stranded on an alien planet, two astronauts must battle deadly elements and each other to recover a reserve shuttle built for one. Black Star is a debut graphic novel by Eric Anthony Glover based on his original unproduced screenplay and illustrated by Ariel Jolna. In the future, interstellar travel is past its prime and sending shuttles beyond our solar system even for a vital scientific research, is a life-threatening gamble. However, in order to retrieve samples of an alien flower that may hold the key to saving countless lives, Harper North and her crew of scientists must journey to Elios, a dangerous planet in deep space. But as they approach, their ship is caught in an asteroid storm, and as it hurtles towards the surface, its reserve shuttle detaches, landing over a hundred kilometers away. When the rest of the crew perishes in the burning wreckage of the ship, North races towards the rescue shuttle built for one, hoping to fulfill their mission and survive. But North isn't alone. The team's wilderness expert is still alive and hell-bent on hunting North down and claiming the shuttle for herself. Now North has no choice but to reach the shuttle first and fast. The fuel is leaking, her GPS battery is dying, and the planet's deadly seasonal change is coming. As she battles the flora and fauna and tries to elude her ruthless former crewmate, North will find the cost of survival is dear. Will she be willing to pay the price? And in September of this year, we get volume one of Malika Warrior Queen. Dark Horse Studios and Unique Studios bring us this title that follows the exploits of Queen and military commander Malaika, who struggles to keep the peace in her ever-expanding empire, Azaz. This historical fantasy is set in 15th century West Africa and created by an all-star team from Nigeria. Growing up as a prodigy, Malaika inherits the crown from her father in an incredibly unusual way, splitting the kingdom of Azaz in half. After years of civil war, Malaika finally unites all of Azaz, expanding it into one of the largest empires in all of West Africa. But expansion will not come without costs. Enemies begin to rise within her council, and Azaz catches the attention of one of the most feared superpowers the world has ever known, the Ming Dynasty. As Malaika fights to win the clandestine war within the walls of her empire, she must also turn her attention to an indomitable and treacherous foe with plans to vanquish her entire people. Since 2012, Roya Okupe has been building a universe of superheroes that spans centuries, centered around African stories crafted by African creators. He says... What we are trying to do over the next few years is create a compelling and immersive universe with our own twist. How? Well, the unique universe is a massive interconnected universe of sci-fi, fantasy, and superhero content spread across multiple timelines with stories told from an African perspective. Is this ambitious? Yes. Is it impossible? Not at all. With this monumental partnership with Dark Horse and the impeccable history, support, and infrastructure they bring to the table, we will finally be able to achieve our ultimate goal, create for a global audience content that empowers African creatives and storytelling. 
And one final title to look forward to, The Other History of the DC Universe uh, will be out in November of this year. Academy Award-winning screenwriter John Ridley examines the mythology of the DC Universe in this compelling new graphic novel. Reframing iconic moments of DC history and charting a previously unexplored socio-political thread as seen through the prism of DC superheroes who come from historically disenfranchised groups. John Ridley goes where no other has gone before. This unique new series presents its story as prose by Ridley, married with beautiful realized color illustrations from a selection of exciting illustrators and comic artists. Extensively researched and masterfully executed, the other history of the DC Universe promises to be an experience unlike any other. You may think you know the history of the DC Universe, but the truth is far more complex. The other history of the DC Universe isn't about saving the world. It's about having the strength to simply be who you are. Thank you so much for listening to me and for listening to this whole presentation tonight. We hope that you enjoyed it and that you have found some titles you'll be adding to your reading lists. Check the library website for details on future programs and resources and books you can pick up curbside.